When we read the Bible, when we read the New Testament, I don't know if you're aware of this or if you thought about it, but when you read about half of the books of the 27 books in the New Testament, you are actually reading someone else's mail, right? You're, you think about that, right? It's the Apostle Paul. This is 2,000 years ago over in the Mediterranean world. And the Apostle Paul is writing to a church, a local congregation of believers who are somewhere in some city around the Mediterranean coast, usually. And he's writing to them about their lives and coming to the Lord Jesus Christ and faith in him. And then talking about some of the issues that come up in any local congregation, values that they have, directions that the, that the church is turning toward. Maybe there's a teaching or doctrine they're getting swayed by. Maybe there's a practice in the church that is getting off track of what God wants them to walk down in obedience to the gospel. And so Paul says, I, I have to write to you and I have to point these things out. There's certain things you're doing that are good and there's some things that need to change and need to get back on the right track. It's very similar, like the Apostle Paul's letter, very similar to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 16. He talks about the Bible. He talks about scripture and Paul says, all scripture is inspired by God. In other words, the Holy Spirit inspired the writings through the human author, through the writing down on pen and, and ink and paper, that the writings that would result were inspired by God. And the beauty of that is that a letter that was written to a church in Greece almost 2,000 years ago can still have great relevance and still have importance and guide our lives today because God, the eternal Holy Spirit, wrote that and inspired that to not only be good for the church in Corinth in the first century, but to be great for us today. So last week we talked about a scandal in church. There was quite a sexual scandal going on. A man was having relations with his own father's wife, with his own stepmother. And rather than, rather than being ashamed of it and disciplining this man, this church was kind of celebrating it. They were saying freedom in Christ. I think about that this week as we're going into the July 4th celebration. The number one word in America we're going to hear all during this week is freedom. Freedom, and when most Americans define that word freedom, you may say, what does that mean to you? It says, well, freedom means I can do whatever I want to do. And the, when we become followers of Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul probably would say, freedom to do whatever you want to do. Hmm, let's talk about that. We're gonna talk about that specifically today when we get to chapter six. So, Last week, Paul reminds the believers they're supposed to live holy lives. They're supposed to live lives that are consecrated to the Lord. And we had a bottom line message last week. Do you remember what that bottom line message was? Well, yeah, now that you put it on the screen, I do remember it. So, so the bottom line message was for a church to be devout. And that's a great religious word. Devout means set apart, consecrated to God, saying, I'm going to live for you, God, not just for myself. For the church to be devout, we have to call sin out. And that's what Paul did last week with that sexual sin. And now he's going to look to the church and he says, and you know what? It's not just what happened back in chapter 5 with that one individual. There's more stuff going on in the church and I have to call this out in front of you so that you can be a church that really is devout. So let's jump right into uh, chapter 6 together, the Apostle Paul talking to the Corinthians. He says, when one, of you, <clears throat> when one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court, that means a court that's in the city or in the community outside the church, to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers. Paul is saying, you guys are... are, are using your, your financial means to sue other believers and you're not able to resolve your differences in the church, you're actually going to secular courts. Once again, to me, it sounds like the fallen culture of the city of Corinth, that fallen culture was now creeping in to the life of the culture of God's people in the church. When somebody's suing another uh, believer, and, and by the way, uh, what immediately came to mind was I said, you know, if Johnny, if Johnny Cash wrote a, wrote a song about this chapter, 
he would entitle the song A Church Named Sue. He would. Be- <laughs> All right. You got to know Johnny Cash. And he was probably, he was one of the original rappers too, because if you listen to that song, that's like, a, it's like a Western rap song. It's really good. A, a Boy Named Sue, I invite you to listen to it. Uh, once again, so uh, what do you think the underlying motives were? Okay, church members are now going to the secular courts and they're, they're bringing lawsuits among other church members to try to get money out. And what do you think the underlying motive is of most of these people? The underlying motive is they're trying to get their money. Their, their motive is you have something that I think belongs to me or there was something done and there was something illegal or legal so you have something that I think is mine and I want what you have or what you're in possession was. So one of the underlying motives that I think Paul is calling out is he says you got to check your own motives when, when you do stuff like that because uh, an underlying motive that could get you in trouble is a motive of greed. And greed, according to the Bible, greed is a form of idolatry. You know what idolatry is, right? Idolatry is, the Bible's very clear in the Ten Commandments. The very first of the Ten Commandments is, you shall have no other gods before me, right? Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. That's what Jesus told Satan when Satan tried to tempt Jesus. So, you shall have no other gods before me, and when something creeps into your life, and when you say this, whatever this thing is, it is so important to me that I don't think I could live without it. When I wake up in the morning, I think about this thing, and if I go to bed at night and this isn't resolved and I don't have this in my life, I don't sleep well at night. If what this is in your life, if that's not the Lord God himself, something is starting to creep in and to take God's place, and that's called an idol. And the Bible says, you shall have no other gods before me. And, when, and that's why Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount, and he said, he said this, he said, no one can serve two masters right? You'll either love one master and you'll hate the other. You'll either serve one and you'll despise the other, but you can't serve both. And so Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and money. And so when greed gets in the way, money becomes the idol. Money becomes the most important thing that you're going after in your life. So not just you shall have no other gods before me. Can you think of any other of the 10 commandments that were being violated when these Christians were bringing these other Christians to court and to, you know, uh, carrying out lawsuits and suing them before the secular court? Any other of the Ten Commandments? Number 10, right. Yeah, number 10. You shall not covet your neighbor's possessions. Coveting means uh, you have something and I really like it and I wish I had it. And I'm kind of not happy that you have it and I don't have it. Right? So it's actually one of the only commandments that is something that could just go on inside your own head. Right? The other ones are all action oriented. But the, the last one is you shall not covet. Your neighbor's possessions was one of the things. How about number eight commandment? You shall not steal. Because if you're going to court and in the first century, I imagine the legal system wasn't all that, quote, just, and I'm sure there were bribes, and I'm sure there was something going on with the judges behind the scenes to try to get a judgment to get you what you want. Can you imagine that's going on in the world today? Corruption, it's like, it's awful, but it's happening out there, and it was certainly happening in the first century, and so uh, you shall not steal, taking something from somebody else, even if you're doing it, quote, legally through the court system. Paul was calling them out on this. He goes down to verse 2 and 3, and he says this, don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? So he's saying, you can't even find somebody in the church to judge these matters. Do you, not believe, do you not realize that at the end of time, when Christ comes again and the, the resurrection of the dead happens or the people that are left alive are going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air and this happens, don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you're going to judge the world, can't you even decide these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? That's an amazing thought, that Christians are actually someday going to be judging the world and judging angels. And Paul, so, so in other words, Paul's lifting up their, their eyes, their countenance and saying, you guys have a great, amazing, responsible 
uh, future. Don't start settling for, le- for lesser things now. Don't start degrading yourselves and going right back into the same practices of the world's people. So, so here's what Paul continues. He says, so, and, and I pr- had to practice this because this is a tongue twister. So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. If you have a legal dispute about such matters, why go to outside judges who are not respected by the church? So here's the principle. What's the principle for God's people in the church today? Instead of suing people in the, in the courts, instead of getting greedy and saying, I want what you have to make it mine because I'll feel more secure in this world if I have more stuff, it says, surely you should be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. You know, truth is, in any church, it's full of people. Uh, if you're looking for a perfect church, please don't go and join it because you will make it immediately imperfect as soon as you join it. Um, the church is full of imperfect people, fallen people being saved by grace, but we're not all there yet. None of us are completely Christ-like yet. Nobody's walking on water in any local church. So the, that means that we have a ways to go. Will we have disagreements in a local church? Will we have a difference of opinion? Yes, we do. Yes, we will. But in the family of God, Paul says, God wants you to resolve those differences amicably, respectfully, and, and come to some kind of a, a, a resolution. And if you can't resolve the difference that you have with an individual, then try to find leaders, wise Uh, mature seasoned leaders in the church to help you resolve that. That's the right way to do it. Don't take, and and again, this sounds bad, but don't take the dirty laundry of the church and put it out there in the world. Because one of the things that made a, uh, was a big value to Paul was Paul says, every church, every local congregation is going to have some kind of reputation in the community, right? I'm sure that we do. I think what we're known for, especially by that that gift that we just received from Brookhaven School at the end of the school year, we are known to be a generous church to the homeless. We are known to help take care of poor people and help feed them and and, uh, clothe them and help them on their way. And we've we've actually seen two of our people now get out of homelessness and they're now living in homes and, and, and have jobs and are back on their feet. So there are some success stories for all the people that struggle years and years and years. So we're, we have a reputation for, like, for that in the community. What, is, what else would our church be known for if the people in this church were suddenly out there in the courts and they were suing each other and you heard about, oh, there's a big blow up in church the other, at this church the other day and there was yelling and screaming in the church and they said, oh, I'll see you in court. You know, if that stuff was going on in the church, it wouldn't take long to get out into the community. And Paul says, guard, protect the reputation that our church has in the community because what we want to be known for is a church of love and a church of grace and a church of truth. We want to reflect our Lord Jesus. The Bible says the law came through Moses. All the Ten Commandments and all the other laws. The law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And we want to be known as a church that combines, that has this healthy mix, combination of grace and truth. Unconditional love, but also we don't compromise on what God's standards are. And so let's don't compromise and start suing each other and the rest of the world. You know, the the whole greedy lawsuit business seems to function on this attitude. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. I will get my due. I'll get my pound of flesh. I'm not just going to get mad. I'm going to get even. And that's pagan. It's a pagan attitude of, of saying that I will not forgive. I will not be slighted. I will not be offended without a response to try to get back at the person who has offended me. We need to be more like Jesus. We need to be able to take an offense and not necessarily fight back. Nofel Staten was the president of our college when Lisa and I were college students at Pacific Christian College, now called Hope International University. Nofel Staten wrote a great commentary on 1 Corinthians. And when he got to chapter 6, he told a story in this commentary. He said this, During the autumn of 1980, one of the most beautiful demonstrations of, quote, not demanding your rights was seen in Los Gatos, California. Kind of 
brought my attention up because I said, hey, Northern California, these guys will know right where Los Gatos is, South San Jose area. There was a diabetic man there who had impaired circulation. He was told that he needed to have one of his legs amputated below the knee. Guess what? One of his legs needed to be amputated below the knee. So guess what happened? After the surgery, it was discovered that the surgeon had cut off the wrong leg. You ever notice that now where they put an X or something on somebody's arm or leg like, hey, this is the one to operate. Don't do the other one. I th it may have come out of such a case like that. So they cut off the wrong leg and the poor man's other leg, that was the one that needed to be amputated. So they had to go back and amputate the other leg as well. And so now below the knee, the man had no legs on both sides. And so... The, the, of course, everyone is probably yelling and screaming at the man. You know what you need to do? Oh, you, this is your get rich. This is your get out of jail free card. This is your get rich quick scheme. You can now sue the hospital for all they have, and you can make a bunch of money on their mistake. And what happened was the man asked that he not be identified by the news media. He refused to pursue legal action against the hospital or against its staff. And when asked, sir, why not? His answer was very simple. He said that everyone, mis everyone makes mistakes in this world. That was his one sentence answer. You know what? Everyone makes mistakes in this world. Can we Christ followers even believe a response like that? You know, a response like that actually reminds me of Jesus' attitude. Because Jesus was also mistreated and he experienced a great deal of injustice, especially during the last day or two of his life. It says this in 1 Peter, when they hurled their insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. Can you imagine the attitude of that? Being horribly mistreated and yet not going for revenge, not trying to get your pound of flesh. He made no threats. He instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. You know, we may have the freedom to do certain things, but Paul says, in the interest of Christ, for the sake of the gospel, for the reputation of God's church here in the community, there's some times where we may have the freedom to do something, and yet God says, I don't want you to do that because I don't want the, the, the reputation of Jesus to be marred here in your own people and your own community. You can exercise. Here's a better way to exercise your freedom. We're talking about Independence Day, freedom. You can exercise your freedom by foregoing your freedom to sue someone. Paul, what Paul is saying is in, in the church, he says, you know what? The eternal relationships that we have in this church the friendships that are going to last forever because we're all going to live forever together, if not here, then in heaven. The eternal relationships that we have here in God's church are more important than temporary money because temporary money is going to go away. Temporary money is going to be no more. There's going to be a time when money doesn't even mean anything. There's going to be a come a time when the streets of gold in heaven are going to have no more value than asphalt, right? And you say, well, how can that even be? Because of the eternal values of God and his people and his church, they, they so much more outweigh temporary things. So Paul goes back to the Corinthians and he says, you're suing each other. You're suing each other in temporary and secular court. The reputation of the church is getting damaged. Paul says this in verse five. He says, I am saying this to shame you. Gee, Paul, why don't you say what you mean? I'm saying this to shame you. Isn't there anyone in all the church who's wise enough to decide these issues? Oh, you don't think that was an ironic little sarcastic dig at the Corinthians who thought themselves were so philosophical, so wise, had all this wisdom and wealth and knowledge. They were full of spiritual gifts. And Paul says, yeah, you're full of, you're full of all those things, but you're not full of certain wisdom that leads to maturity. And this is the kind of, of wisdom that, Paul says, you need more of. Isn't there anybody who's wise enough to decide these issues? But instead, one believer sues another, right in front of unbelievers. 
Even to have such lawsuits with one another is, is a defeat for you. And you know why I think he's saying that? Because by the time you get to a lawsuit, you've had umpteen opportunities to reconcile. You've had umpteen opportunities to forgive and let it go. And somehow in both parties, nobody was willing to do that. Nobody was willing to take a hit. Nobody was willing to absorb some pain and some loss for the sake of Christ. And he says, that's a defeat for you. Why not just accept the injustice and leave it at that? Why not let yourselves be cheated? Instead, you yourselves are the ones who do wrong and cheat even your fellow believers. So somewhere Paul knew by the Spirit of God, by revelation, that it, it wasn't just a, an unjust thing that happened and a ripoff and you're just trying to get what is owed you. Now they're taken to each other's court in order to cheat even your fellow believers. And that's why Paul brings up the issue of greed. So Paul says this in verse 9, and now he's going to give this whole catalog of sins. And he's going to say, hey, by the way, besides greed, there are plenty of other sins and wrongdoings that were happening in the church in the past. Um, Paul says this in verse 9, don't you realize that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God? Now when he's saying that those who do wrong, you got to understand that the tense of the verb means those who continue to live in such a way. It's not a one-time slip up. It's not, I did this one time and I really regret it. I'm sorry for it and I don't plan on ever doing it again. It's talking about a lifestyle. It's talking about a habit of activity that those who do wrong will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul says, don't fool yourselves. Those who indulge, and, and you're going to see a list of 10 different kinds of sin or wrongdoing. Those who indulge in sexual sin or who worship idols or commit adultery or are male prostitutes or practice homosexuality or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or abusive, or cheat people. There's 10, 10 different, different types of sins. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. That's a sobering verse for all God's people today. Because I think any one of us can look down that list and say, well, I'm not guilty of a lot of those, but I might be guilty of some of them. I might be guilty of, of one of those. I may have something that has a little stronghold in my life and I can't quite overcome in that area. Uh, how would you like to join a church? Paul says, um, don't you realize that, these, that the list of these people who regularly practice these kinds of sins, they're not gonna inherit the, the, the kingdom of God. How would you like to join a church full of people who had regularly lived and practiced this list of sins? Say, Wow, seriously? To my left and right? You used to do all this stuff? So the Corinthian church certainly was. I think Paul founded the church. I think Paul knew the lives of these people pretty well. He knew their background. He knew what they were overcoming when they came to faith and trust in Jesus. I think Paul gave them this list to remind them of how far they had come. Here's the beauty of Christ, he's saying. Christ has an amazing transformative power that yes, he takes us just as we are. We don't have to jump through a bunch of hoops to become followers of Christ. Just as I am without one plea, that thy blood was shed for me. Paul reminds them where they came from. Christ in his transforming gospel message he doesn't leave us where we were. He takes us as we are, but he doesn't leave us there. Jesus empowers us to change. And so Paul goes on and he says, well, let me, let me quote this C.S. Lewis because C.S. Lewis talks about all the kinds of ways that we human beings try to find meaning and purpose in life apart from God. And so he writes, out of that hopeless attempt has come nearly all that we call human history, money, poverty, ambition, War, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery. The long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. That's where idolatry comes in. Putting something in place that is the most important thing in your life other than God. And it can never make you happy because only God, it, only, that relationship that we have in God, he created that, us this way and we cannot function right any other way than in a proper right relationship with God. And so, 
Yes, we have freedom. Paul's going to go on and talk about freedom now, and he's going to say, okay, you used to act this way, but guess what? Jesus did a transformative work in your life. Some of you were once like that, he says in verse 11. Some of you were once like that, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So, yeah, you used to live that way, but don't you realize what Jesus did in your life? First of all, he washed you by the washing of rebirth. Second, he sanctified you, or he is in the process of sanctifying us, which means he's setting us apart uh, to be holy, to be set apart from the world, to be more like Jesus and the bride of Christ. And he's, he's washed you, he sanctified you. And that other word, made right with God, which the New Living Translation puts it this way, the, the New International Version says, he justified, or he declares you not guilty by God himself when you put your trust in Jesus. So don't forget where you came from. Some of you used to live a lifestyle this way, but God has changed you from the inside out. When you put your trust in Jesus, he gave you a number of gifts. He gave you a community of faith to help you walk the straight and narrow path that God calls you. Enter by the narrow gate, Jesus says. The church is here to help us, to help each other, to walk that narrow path. He gives us his Holy Spirit that isn't just God overall, it is God in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory through the Holy Spirit. That's, that spirit of God is now helping you live a life that pleases God. So he gives you the church, he gives you the Holy Spirit, and he gives you his word. He gives you the Bible, the revelation. Your, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. That God illuminates our, our path through the revelation of his word. So Jesus is there to help us, and he's saying, you need to live a life that's set apart to God. And now Paul's going to say, I got to call out one other sin that's happening in the church. And it's not a sin about a man and his, step, his stepmother or his father's wife. It's not about Christians taking each other to court. It's about what's happening up on the hill, Corinthians. Do you remember what was up on the hill in the city of Corinth? You, have you ever seen a map of Corinth? There's a big temple up there. And the temple is dedicated to the goddess of love in the Greek culture. Her name was Aphrodite. And, and <laughs> that's right. That's right. Aphrodite was the goddess of love. And in, quote, worship, in that pagan culture of the goddess of love, these temple prostitutes or priestesses, as they're known in the euphemistic language, they would come down off the temple mount and they would invite men and women or whoever it was in the, in the city of Corinth to come up and, quote, worship the goddess of love with them by having sexual relations. And so Paul has to call this out. Now, he starts off, Paul starts off very, uh, very uh, cleverly because he's going to quote a proverb from the Corinthians and he's going to say, hey, this is a saying that you guys believe among yourselves. You guys say this all the time and you believe it and you think, well, if it applies to food and that's a physical thing, it probably applies to sex too because that's a physical thing. And Paul says, uh-uh, it doesn't. Paul says this, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but, for every, but not everything is good for you. You know, this is so great for the American church coming into Independence Day to hear. You know, freedom, freedom to do whatever I want. Yeah, but is everything you want to do good for you? Even though I am allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and the stomach for food. This is true, although someday God will do away with both of them. But you cannot say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. After all, we have a hunger inside, we have a thirst, uh, and there's water for thirst, there's food for hunger, we have a, a drive for sex in our own human bodies, so why don't we just go out and do that, however that looks? Because that's just a physical drive. You see what the argument was? And Paul says, no, it's not the same way. Food is a whole different category. And there's lots of people out there that are abusing food too, that are, not eat, that are eating way more than they need to eat, that are eating unhealthy ways, that are destroying themselves physically by the way they eat. So you can take even a good thing, which we all need to eat to stay alive. We all need to eat to be healthy, and that can be turned into a bad thing. Paul says, here's another gift 
that God gave man, and man has now twisted it and perverted it into something that is totally unhealthy for the human race. You cannot say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord, and the Lord cares about our body. You know, the issue here, obviously, that Paul's talking about is sex, and God has made his will clear for each of us. The joining of bodies and sexual relations, like we said last week, it is to be reserved for marriage between a man and a woman, exclusive and permanent. You know, in other words, for life and only with one partner. It's God's design of how he wants us to become one flesh. And it has the possibility of procreation, of bringing another human being into the world. Yeah, and, and I remember growing up and getting sex education as kids. I remember being a teacher, and this is what you tell the kids for sex education. I remember this almost 20 years ago. And what were they talking about? They were talking about the negative consequences consequences of sexual activity and they'd say well there's a chance of unwanted pregnancy oh there's a possibility of sexually transmitted diseases and you know what all of that is true but even if there were no disease caught even if there was no unwanted pregnancy there's still something wrong about that activity because somebody is still getting hurt foremost it's hurting God because he's the one indwelling you by his Holy Spirit. And this is where Paul's going with this. Paul's saying, don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is a part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? It's kind of a rhetorical question, and that's why Paul answers, never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her? For the scriptures say the two are united into one. Wow, guess where that came from? Right there in Genesis 2.24, when the first man and the woman are joined together in marriage by God, and that's when God says, therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And he's saying, you're taking something that God designed, and now you're acting that way temporarily um, just to, uh, for sexual activity with a prostitute. And the person who's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So Paul's saying, look, Christ is in you. His Holy Spirit is in you. He is holy. He is trying to set you apart unto God. Don't take your physical body, which now has the Lord Jesus in his spirit living inside of you. Don't take that body and join it to a prostitute or have sexual relations outside of marriage. That is, that is polluting the temple of the Holy Spirit, which God bought for himself when he died for you on the cross. So what does Paul say to do with it? What's the antidote? The antidote is the same antidote that Joseph discovered, I believe it was in Genesis chapter 29, almost 2,000 years before Jesus came along. Here's Joseph. He's made, he's sold by his brothers into slavery into Egypt. And about 15 years later, he becomes prime minister of the whole country of Egypt. But before Joseph became prime minister of Egypt, he was a servant in this captain of the guard's home there in Egypt. And this captain of the guard had a wife, and the wife liked Joseph a lot. Joseph apparently was a handsome man. The wife started desiring Joseph, and the wife asked Joseph repeatedly over and over again, the Bible says, every, whether it was every day or not, if Joseph would sleep with her and have relations. And Joseph kept saying, nope, 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 nope. I can't do it, I can't dishonor your husband, and I can't dishonor God, whom I believe in and whom I serve. And finally, the woman grabs him and demands that Joseph have relations with her, and he, what did Joseph do? He ran, he fled, he got out of there to the point where his own shirt was torn off his back. And now the woman has this, whole, this torn shirt and she gets jilted. And you know, uh, what, is the, what does the saying go? Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. And now she's upset that she was rejected. And so she cries rape and Joseph gets thrown into prison. But Joseph did the right thing. Even when sexual immorality was right there, it was very easy. It was very available. She was begging him. He ran away from it. And that's the same thing that Paul says just as Joseph fled from sexual sin, Paul's telling us to do the same thing. Verse 18, run, flee from sexual sin. No other sin, is so clear, no other sin so clearly affects the body as this one does. 
Sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you and was given to you by God? Do You do not belong to yourself. See, this is where this freedom comes in, right? This is where the American Christian has to say, wait a minute. Freedom to do whatever I want to do is not the same as freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ means now God has set me free from sin and death, but now God has made me free to do what I ought to do, to live the way that I should live. And I don't have to be a slave to sin anymore. I can be free to live the way Christ wants me to live. I don't have to be a slave to my culture or a slave to my own desires. I can live free. So he says, you do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a high price. You don't think it would cost, Je cost Jesus his entire life when he died on the cross for us. That when he redeemed us, which means to purchase somebody out of slavery into freedom. So that's where, that's where it says, so God bought you with a high price. So you must honor God with your body. Now, here's the thing, because it's one thing to say, okay, our bodies are made for the Lord. Our, we should honor God with our body. Yes, yes, yes. But how do you do that? Because sexual temptation is pretty strong out there. I don't know if you've noticed that. There's lots of different ways to lead us astray. So how are we going to do that? It's not just we shouldn't be led into sexual immorality. We should flee sexual immorality. But how? How do we do that? And I'm talking mostly to men now in this room, but when we do our bulletin, uh, fill in the blanks in your bulletin, this is where the fill in the blanks are. How to flee from sexual immorality. How can you successfully have uh, a victory in the area of sexual immorality in your life? How do, we run how do we run away from that which is wrong, that which is one of the worst sins because it affects even our own body? How can we avoid that and stay pure before God? Number one, number one, bounce, what, bounce? Bounce your eyes. I got this from my son, Tyler. Tyler uh, came across some, uh, some uh, book that he was reading called Every Man's Battle, and he said the number one uh, recommendation by all the men who are struggling with sexual immorality, which is like 99.9% .9 of the men, he said this is the best way that they have victory. It starts right there in your mind and in your heart. Uh, this is where Martin Luther says, you know, when it comes to immorality, I can't keep birds from flying over my head. In other words, I can't keep, you know, women, attractive women from coming across my view. He says, I can't keep birds from flying over my head, but I don't need to build a nest on top of my head either for them to land, right? That, that's his way. I, I, you know, when you're in the 1500s, you don't have a lot of good illustrations, but he did that one. So, Number one, bounce your eyes. This is where Job, even Job was talking about, I, I, I was pure before God. I was trying to be innocent in my life before God. He said, I made a covenant with my eyes, a formal, solemn agreement with my eyes not to look with lust upon a young woman. Very much echoed by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. So in other words, where does sexual desire get started? It gets started right up here in our heads, in our, in our eyes, in our mind. So bounce your eyes. In other words, don't look too uh, long and hard at an attractive woman. Don't look too long and hard. I said this to a youth group one time. You remember I told you this story in the 80s. You know, we're in Chino, California, and they got these two big twins. Uh, they were great young guys, but they were so like, like, like raw in their responses. And so we were talking about sexual immorality, and he says, you know, and I said, the, I think the, the best way to have victory in the area is when you see an attractive girl go by, uh, don't, uh, don't give her the second look. And, and they say, well, what do you mean? And I said, well, you know, you know the second look, right? First thing is you're, wa you're walking by, and you see her, and you go, you know, you're, you're like, like, whoa, there's an attractive woman there. And then you're like, oh, don't look. And then, and then something in you says, you just um, looked away from something you shouldn't be looking away from. And then, so you look the second time. And he says, and I said, so it's not really the first look that gets you in trouble. It's the second look. So watch out for the second look. And you know what his response was? He says, well, Jim, I'm just going to make the first look last a while. <laughs> no, that's not what I'm talking about. So bounce, bounce your eyes, bounce your eyes. You know, look somewhere else. Think about, because then you're not going to fixate on that. Okay, number two. Number one was bounce your eyes. Number two was remember 
his or her identity. Remember his or her identity. This is not an, an, uh, this is not a person who is a non-person who's just, quote, a sex object. This is an individual person created in the image of God. Uh, in 1 Timothy, it says, treat older women as mothers. Treat uh, women your age as sisters with all purity. I think what it was saying, I think Paul was saying is, remember that every woman that you look at is somebody's mother or somebody's sister or somebody's wife or somebody's daughter. In other words, there's a person that is very valuable to somebody else, even though you may not see her that way in this moment. Remember his or her identity, number two. Number three, we go to the next slide now, or yeah. Number, number three, remember your identity. How do you successfully flee from sexual immorality? Remember your identity. Who are you? Paul says, remember, you are not... Uh, you, are, you are not free to do whatever you want. You're free to do whatever Christ wants you to do. You, uh, you were bought with a price, therefore honor God with your body. You're a child of God, and as such, that means you're going to honor God in everything you do. I am a child of God. I live for a higher purpose. I do not live just for the things of this world. I, just, I do not live just for my own physical desires. I have a higher identity than that. So bounce your eyes. Remember his or her identity. Remember your identity. And then number four, do what Joseph did. Run, flee, get out of there. I don't know if I told you this story from the pulpit. I told it to a men's group one time. But uh, when I first became a youth pastor, this is back another Chino story, back in the 80s, uh, uh, back when I was a youth pastor in Chino, and I got invited by one of my good Christian friends. We went to the same Christian college. He invites me to one of his friend's bachelor parties because uh, he was getting married and we're having a bachelor party. Now, all my Christian bachelor parties were like we played, we played poker, uh, we smoked some cigars, we drank some root beer. You know, it was real wild bachelor parties that we had among our Christian group. So I'm thinking that this guy, hey, my Christian buddy who goes to the same Christian college that I did, he's got a friend who's getting married. It's going to be a, it's going to be a clean bachelor party. Nothing like on the, in the movies. And we get over there and everything's going fine. We're having pizza and we're yucking it up. And the next thing you know, the doorbell rings and it is a woman in a trench coat. And I'm thinking to myself, for, well, the first thought was what's under the trench coat? But <laughs> But the second thing, the, the second thing was like, Jim, this is one of those moments. This is a moment that, is, that could define you. Are you going to stay or are you going to go? Because the Bible says, run, flee, get out of there. So I uh, bid a hasty retreat and I got out of there. So in that particular case, that was a victory. No more mental tug of war. No negotiating. No, I'll just ask forgiveness later. Uh, all the kind of things that, that we can do in our mental gymnastics to try and justify the behavior of the moment. So run, flee, get out of there. And then number five, the last one is very important too because I think a lot of our struggles in this area, for guys especially, it's a struggle that's private. It's a struggle that's kind of secret. It's a struggle that we don't want anybody else to know about, that we assume that not everybody else struggles with this even though most of them do. And all the surveys of men, sexual immorality and, and lust and everything is the number one sin that we deal with. So number five, the way to have victory in this area is be accountable to someone. Be accountable to your wife or to your husband or to your trusted friend. We were up at a Thrive conference in May. Lisa and I were listening to this guy uh, named Chris Brown, and he's a great Christian speaker. I, I had no idea that he limited himself, that he was this accountable to his wife. But he was watching TV with his friends, and they were going to watch, I think it was Sunday night football. He had made a pact to his wife to say, I am not going to be alone watching my cable television, alone in a room without my wife. He had his wife program the remote control. Can Guys, can you imagine yourself doing this? He, he programmed the remote control to only his wife had the code she set the code and she kept the code secret so that whenever he wanted to watch TV, he actually came to her and said, dear, I'd like to watch TV now. And she coded open the remote control for him. You know, my first thought was, wow, like what, you know, when did you start wearing a skirt and lose your band? But that was my first thought. My first thought was that, but my second thought was, wow, 
you really want to have victory in this area. You really are, are, are trying to honor God in this area of your life, and you know your own weaknesses. So he was willing to humble himself to that point to let his wife do that. And that was to open the code so he could watch Sunday night football with his friends. So it's like, wow, he was accountable to somebody to ensure that he was going to have victory. Paul says that committing immoral sex, it's incongruent with our union with Christ Jesus. If we sin sexually, we defile the temple of the Holy Spirit. We defile our own bodies. So the idea is you can honor God with your body and mind if you do these things, if you're willing to establish these boundaries. It is not impossible, but you have to commit to this safe pathway. You have to limit your own freedom and stick with it if you're willing to do that. Not just freedom to do whatever you want, but freedom to do what is right. The bottom line in this one, the bottom line last week was for the church to be devout, we have to call sin out. The bottom line for this week is honor God with your body. Honor God with your body. You say to yourself, I belong to God. Jesus bought my freedom. Therefore, I will honor God with my body, even if it costs me. The truth will set you free. Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer together and I invite you to bow your heads and close your eyes with me. And I know this has been a difficult, challenging message. This is not an easy one to hear. This is a, certainly a, a very difficult teaching to put into practice and have consistent victory in our lives. So I, I understand the way that we have victory in this area is we, we take a, a self-examination all the time. We examine ourselves before God in his presence and we say, God, I, I just, I want to be honest and open and transparent before you and I want you to reveal to me if there are any areas in my life where I am misusing, not my body, I'm misusing your body because you say that I belong to you. And God, if there is any way that I'm dishonoring to you, I confess it to you. I ask you to forgive me. And I ask the Lord to give me the strength and the power and the wherewithal to be able to have victory in this area in the future. And I pray, God, that I'll start putting into practice these ways that I can have victory and honor you with my body. Lord, help me to be accountable. Help me to, to, to do all the things that we talked about today. Lord, what do you want me to start doing in my life? What do you want me to do that is different, that is going to be more honoring to you in the long run, that is going to uh, change my life so much for the better and give me freedom and victory in this area? What is it, Lord, that you want me to stop doing? Lord, help me. Show me the way to get back on the right path with you because I confess to you I am weak in my flesh and I need your help. Lord, for all of us, help us to honor you with our bodies. Help us to remember that the way that we live, the way that we eat, whatever we do with our physical bodies is a reflection of our relationship with you. So Lord, you're the one. We, we want to we be able to shout and proclaim what the Apostle Paul proclaimed at the end of this letter to the Corinthians. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to have victory in this area. And, and uh, may you get all the honor and the glory and the credit for it. And may the name of Jesus continue to be magnified in our lives, in the lives of our church, and in the lives of the reputation that our church projects out in this community. Help us to be a church full of truth and a church full of grace. In Jesus' name, amen.